Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Alright. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Hey, Ron, when are you, when you are? Yeah. Okay, Jeff. Jeff? Right. They're ready when you are. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining. Thanks for coming to the official February regular monthly meeting. as well as Canonical and Brandor Group. Brandor Group, yeah, I saw that. And, uh, uh, yeah. on the site. and uh, Ron Guerin and uh, Peter Norton, Tony, Larry. Is Larry here? No, no, no. Okay. Sunny, I mentioned Brian, Dave Bristow, uh, Rob. Jonas, Chris, Greg, Danny. Stephanie Schultz, we need some people right away. Yeah. And she's yeah, yeah, yeah. She's in the first room. Thank you for that, John. Boy. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see. We uh, have our mailing list that will tell you all about the new meetings. So you can get onto nylight.org and subscribe to the announcement list. There's also a pretty uh, active social community on the Nylight Talk mailing list, as well as the IRC chat. And uh, the Python workshop's coming up. Um, we'd like to make an announcement. It's actually the hack workshop now. The hacking, the <coughs> hacking workshop. I like yes. that name one. It incorporates more. Mm -hmm. Are you okay? Yes. Do your workshops uh, assume a knowledge of the subject <coughs> under discussion, or are they introductory, or are they at all different levels? All different levels. Is each one at a level, or is each one at many levels? Um, each one's many levels. Oh, okay. So come one, come all, whether you're advanced or new. It's a good social environment to jump in if you're running through your topic and uh, I can place the network with others who have more advanced skills. So I'm tearing down the boundaries. Does anybody else have any answers? Oh, nice. Anybody? I actually heard that one. All right. Um, actually, I have everyone. We're uh, looking, looking to work on a new NILOG website soon. Um, we have the, the volunteers list you can join about that specifically, or you can just uh, bring it up on NILOG <coughs> talk. But we'll be looking for people who uh, know, know uh, things about Git, uh, hopefully, uh, PHP, MySQL, uh, anybody who's graphically inclined, we can do some help with that, Any, anything related to that. And uh, we'll, give you, uh, we'll put your name on the website if that's what you want or not, if that's what you want. <laughs> HTML. What HTML? Uh, HTML. Uh, oh, well, whatever you like. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to us. Okay. So, uh, my oh, first, yes, Brian, you have an one, one announcement, there's an event next month on the 9th of March called DevOps Day, which is, uh, you know, for people who are into configuration management and automation tools like the sysadmins and uh, developers <coughs> have a fusion thing where developers are doing sysadmin and sysadmins are doing development. And that's on the 9th. Uh, I think there's a meetup group about it, but I'm going to send an announcement to the list. So. Okay, cool. So, um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our speaker tonight. A very interesting topic. Uh, the Diaspora Project has taken all of the uh, good pieces of technology and, and that, that is free and is making it available to people who uh, don't need to have all their rights and privacy and information uh, gleaned by Facebook. So, who would have thought grassroots once again coming to the rescue in this case for social networking? So. Yeah. Actually, they're leaking out. They're leaking out. They're leaking out. That's right. Crash. 
He's just crashing at the area. Yeah, but I know some of the other hmm. Why would you know them? Are they no longer secret? What? Why would you know them? Are they no longer secret? Well, I won't actually tell you, but I just there's a recording being made of this, and I'll use it to threaten my bosses. Oh. All right. Well, as the computer is restarting, I can at least uh, tell you guys where we're coming from. That's our first slide, actually, so we can get that out of the way. Um, oh, oh, yeah, it's I not really um, So, okay, I'm here. All right. So, Rafi and I, um, I'm Daniel, this is Rafi. We're half of the diaspora team. Uh, we're all from NYU. We came from NYU's ACM club basically just like a nerd club, which is really awesome. NYU gave us an office, which is kind of like a freak incident. So uh, we had a space to basically hack on little projects. Like the uh, one project is like we had a, like an RFID reader, and we had like a, our ACM door would tweet every time somebody came in. Just doing stuff like that. Um, and uh, we met basically over uh, building a MakerBot on uh, many late nights, uh, like late Friday nights, you say, until like five in the morning, building this thing. It works, it's great. Um, and uh, after we built the MakerBot, Evan Moglin, which most of you probably know or are familiar with, he came to NYU and gave his infamous Freedom in the Cloud talk, uh, where he was basically bashing cloud services and how all of your information is basically taken from you, right? Like everything is free in terms of monetary value, but your private information is like totally getting jacked, which is not so great for people. But, uh, there you go. Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, uh, so, Evan, Evan came to town, uh, and we saw him make his talk, and we got really inspired. He had this idea of a freedom box, where you get a Shiva plug, or a Guru plug, <coughs> And the idea is, in his vision, you take this plug, you put it under your bed, plug it in, and all of a sudden you get all of this. Uh, here we go, the next one. Yeah. All right, there you go. This is Evan. <laughs> uh, this is the ACM room, and this is a picture of the MakerBot. It's not ours. But um, yeah, so Evan Moglin had a talk about um, his vision of a Freedom Box where you plug in this plug computer very cheap, like $90 or something. Um, and you would be able to do all of your services off of that. The idea is that we built the software to power this little computer, and uh, <clears throat> we can do Gmail, Facebook, all that stuff on our own turf, right? Under our bed. That's where our information is stored. So, the Times just ran a story on him today, if, if anyone caught that. I saw it. Jim Dwyer, actually, the guy. Yeah, it's a pretty good piece. Who uh, did our article, actually. Great article, you guys check it out. Um, so we got really influenced by Evan's speech. We were really pumped up about it. And we thought, well, let's uh, take a crack at some of it. Uh, let's make a decentralized social network for nerds, right? We didn't know anybody else would be really interested in it. So we went to Kickstarter with the idea of, well, we want to make this thing uh, over three months in the woods and just program it. We thought we need $10,000 to do it. For <coughs> Um, so we went on Kickstarter, posted a really terrible video at the three one morning, asking for money, and it got picked up by the free culture list and Twitter, then it got onto the New York Times, and we ended up raising actually two hundred thousand dollars to basically make free software. Yes! What's yeah. wrong with free software? Yeah. No money. Did, did you just wrong with go through the website or did you meet the friends <laughs> uh, We know Fred. We know Fred. And we went through the website. Except uh, beer, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we got $200,000 to make free software for the Okay, I, I, you give him the punch, I'm, I'm leaving him. Yeah. <laughs> it's a success if you produce no code. I'll, I'll, I'll listen to the rest. <laughs> um, I don't know where the there we go. So, so that happened. Rafi's brother actually started around that time working at Pivotal Labs in San Francisco. They're like a very elite Ruby on Rails Ruby shop. Um, and Rafi's brother asked the CEO, Rob, me, would it be cool if we got some space for free? And Rob, me was like, 
uh, really adamant about the idea, and so we're actually programming in with the labs right now. We have been since June, and they're giving us free space and breakfast. So I want to give like, a big <laughs> shout out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to fly out to San Francisco every morning to have breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> it's a big commute, but the breakfast is really <laughs> So, on the plane? Uh, no, when we get there. So, uh, so, we've been going since June. We're about seven months into the project. We're right? still, so, you know, bootstrappy, and the four of us are the core core team. And you can find the code on GitHub right now. But, um, Apart from the four of us, we want to give some like really big shout outs to some of our top top contributors in the community. We have Sarah May, who is actually she works at Google Labs, she's a pivot, and she's taken a good liking to our project, which is awesome because she's one of the best review programmers ever, in my opinion. She's really awesome. Uh, we have Dan Hansen, who uh, who's a JavaScript ninja and he is actually, I think like 16. 17. Uh, he's done a lot of great JavaScript work for us. There's Dennis, who actually runs a pretty big installation of Diaspora in Germany. He has uh, thousands of people on it, which is really awesome. And there's uh, Joan Haas, who um, he basically triages all of our translations. I'm not sure how many.
to be connected with somebody and they have to respond. So there is no follow model. It's strictly a mutual connection. Um, and you can selectively send status messages and photos to certain aspects, certain chunks of your contacts. Uh, it's pretty, it's really clear, and uh, people seem to like it a lot. They get it. Uh, there's a comment system, and it's fully federated, as is everything. And uh, you can post messages to Twitter and Facebook, and when you post public messages, it generates uh, RSS feeds, which we'll talk about a little later. And then do you go? I, well, the great thing is, uh, right now we don't have, um, we don't, we don't have like, we're not directly using their API, but on Identica, somebody could follow a diaspora user, and their public post would show up. We actually have an Identica module that is like, has been contributed, which we're still reviewing, and hopefully we'll bring it into the code base in the next couple of weeks. Identica or Laconica? Excuse me? It's a plugin directly for the site, or it's for the code base, Laconica? Uh, it's a stats.net. So. Right. So, yeah, coming soon, but you can follow our diaspora user <coughs> on Identica today. Um, so, this is uh, what the interface looks like right now. Seven months up. Uh, yeah, so this is all subject to change. Um, I'm like, curious to move things around. But, uh, so right now you have your feed, right? Contacts and uh, these are public messages if they're green that anybody can see. Um, on the on the right side of the screen, you have all your aspects listed out. So can you see the people in them? So it's very clear. You have uh, we have a notification system. We hook into SendGrid to deliver emails to everybody. So you get a notification if somebody comments on your post. Somebody sends you a request. If somebody mentions you. We also have mentions built in, which was uh, just pretty fun JavaScript to code, believe it or not, in that box. Uh, and uh, yeah, and along the top, you also have these tab-like uh, elements where you can tab into aspects. And you, select, you can select multiple aspects at once. It's a very fluid experience. And then you have the search up top and your user controls. So this is all subject to change. So multiple aspects is a union or a yeah. section? It's a, it's a union. So if you want to post to, say, like uh, Linux guys and San Francisco guys at once, you can click two of them and then you send a message. Does that say Facebook up there on the right edge? I'm getting my eyes tested tomorrow. You've got to ease them into it. Is that like new Twitter, old Twitter? Kind of, yeah. So, uh, and this is a, a user page. Somebody actually syndicates progress <coughs> Twitter uh, onto Diaspora. And the reason why I chose Barack Obama is because you can see this is a user page. It's in the, in the interface. But if you see the search up top and the address bar, you can see we're at joindiaspora.com right now, right? Slash people, slash an ID. We've actually searched for Barack Obama at diaspora.org, which is a completely different installation. Now, uh, we're going to go into this discovery mechanism actually right after this. But you can see this is a user page as I'm seeing it through Join Diaspora, but it's actually Barack Obama has his service hosted on a completely different server. So you can see the interface is uh, kind of disregards federation where it's in. Every user is basically the same, so we have a very cohesive experience. And, uh, yeah. So the point is you can be on any, any installation that you want, so your experience is not hindered. I have a vague idea of what the word federated Oh, sure. Is there some definition? So, um, so, okay, so, Rev, do you want to explain this? Sure. Uh, we use federated as opposed to distributed to mean a system where there's multiple large servers that people use, more like um, sort of the old style of having an account on a university's mainframe than everyone running their own computer. As in, as in uh, email is federated. So email would be considered, as, it, as email usually is done, a federated server. Right, because you can have multiple people on a single installation. Right. Yeah, 
that are not under your control? For example, do you share data or like uh, accounts with uh, the guy out in uh, San Francisco running his uh, uh, diaspora server? So you don't share account data, but data that you share with someone who has an account <coughs> on another server is, you know, is fettered through that server. Okay. So not, you know, you're logging, you can't log in to any server. You have a server that's yours. but. Uh, there is sort of a, whatever you say to someone is something that they know. You mentioned Twitter. I've given a unique measure of microblogging resource. People know to post stuff everywhere, including the internet in Los Angeles. How do they get involved in the process? Uh, you say that again? <laughs> <laughs>
you know, later on build IMF support into it. But not right now. The idea is that you have a username that you're giving, which is unique to the server. Um, <coughs> this holds the information, so when you give this to somebody, the software knows exactly where to send information and what user you're doing. Uh, we're using existing protocols for most of this stuff, if not all. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, so we're using Webfinger to do so, and, and we have uh, we use H cards to just put some profile information. In. But Discovery is really good around the uh, concept of a web Webfinger. It was developed by Blank Code. <coughs> You're a really smart guy. So how Discovery works is you want to find somebody. So right now in the search, if you're given somebody's, if you need somebody, they'll tell you what their uh, account is, much like an email. So you type it into the search box, and what happens on the server side is that um, the server pings, it takes their, their uh, username and network name, and it puts their network name into what pod, what installation it's going to ping. Uh, and it pings this one route, well-known post meta, which is basically a routing file, uh, which the server parses this and figures out where their web finger profile location schema is. And that, um, so if you hit joindiaspera.com, the server hits joindiaspera.com, it gets this back from joindiaspera.com slash web finger with a query string with the URI, and the URI is the, uh, Username and um, what's it called? Network it's name. a template for requesting a specific person's profile. Yeah. So we get that. The server bounces off of that. It goes to the Webfinger profile proper, which includes uh, the location to that person's H card. Um, it includes the pod location again. It includes a link to that user's public Adam feed. And uh, it also includes that user's public key which uh, is used for verification and whatnot. Um, and this is a sample H card. This is where you can find it right now. H card slash user slash the user ID. But uh, it houses that person's uh, full name, pod location, uh, user images, and if that person wants to be searchable or not. So what we do, uh, when we, once we get this uh, server, parses this all into a Ruby objects and stores that person's profile into your database, so it caches them. Um, and you can see their profile page just like any other page. And this happens really quickly. So that's how uh, a server will find somebody on a different server. You have to put in there. Yes? I just wanted to touch on you said that it functions, the discovery functions much in the same way as an email. And I think this is a fairly technical crowd that already understands that the reason it functions much like an email is because it is an address as email is. It is, in fact, a universal yes. resource identifier to which we have only thus far attached two things at that network protocol level, specifically email in the form of an MX record and um, your domains in the form of you know your, your, your A records or your top level. So you know what domain is, is, is able to talk to their domain to look up these addresses. But these addresses are capable of having all these these searches, you know, or, sorry, services attached to them, much much as you're doing. I just wanted to point out, you know, this. I, I, I presume most people have already familiar with this kind of it doesn't, is, and it kind of perpetuates the whole thing. Oh, well, it's like email. Well, well, it's absolutely not in that sense. Of course, email is just this one thing that we happen to have attached already as a legacy. Um, and I, I, it's my interpretation of the project, and it's kind of like moving in that direction of actually using URIs and attaching these services to them. And one of the values, and I don't want to like like jump jump your you know, bus here, but but that you know by having an open platform federated version of this, we kind of like prevent this train from taking off of pushing all of these protocols that are attached to these to your uh, your address up to this layer that we now find merged, you know, the, the, the uh, application and the physical layers, like the Comcast merger, kind of the locking and putting in these walled gardens. I mean, that's what I interpret like one of the really the strengths of the project. Yeah, yeah, it's always. The if any of that doesn't make sense, please tell me, because that's, I'm just kind of. No, it does. Yeah. it does. Sorry if it sounded watered down. Yeah, your point is completely valid. All right, uh, so we want to move right along, talk about message passing. What happens when you post something in the okay. So what happens is, once you make a message, what happens on your server, pod A, um, is that your message gets 
serialized into XML objects. So you see here it's a sample status message. We have the raw message of what I wrote. The GUID, we, have, we keep global unique identifiers for every post on the system. So it can easily uh, you know, pinpoint something across servers. Uh, your diaspora handle, which is that uh, username, that domain. Uh, a public flag just telling the other server if it was in fact public or not. And to create it at time because the post will be saved at a different time as the post of creation proper. Um, so that happens. And uh, the XML is then encrypted and signed with the user's private key, which is generated when you make a new user, a new private key is generated for that user. And it's signed using OpenSSL's RSA library. And I wanted to say something about this. Yeah, so this basically, you can, you know, to say like email again, it's uh, all like HTTP encrypted email. We have an AES encrypted block, an RSA encrypted block with the AES key in it, and an RSA signature for the second place. The AES signature. Yeah. So, can you hook at all into web of trust? Uh, or do you have your we own? We don't right now. Ah! We <laughs> Sorry. It's something we Sorry. think about. Um, held back decent public cryptography for decades. Sorry. It's, it's something we think about, but exposing someone who isn't technical to yeah. like web of trust requirements is really difficult. Sorry. So, um, well, I mean, maybe, and I, I guess part of your goal is to change <laughs> this at some point. I imagine now a lot of your audience is that technical. Uh, I think that's true. It's certainly more technical than the general population, but definitely not completely technical. That was one thing that surprised us in our initial days of getting Kickstarter donations was a lot of people we got donations from weren't technical people. So, I mean, that's one reason UX is like one of our main focuses in just building the website. Is it private messaging on it yet? Uh, it's like totally it's almost, almost there. It's not, well, you can't post in somebody's profile. It's like Twitter where you post something, but people can comment on it. So anyway, well, my point is to just encode that message. Yeah. Yeah, so this is sent over. Yeah, so this, that message is, is posted to whatever the, whatever file the recipient is at. And right now it's posted to a, a central receive hook and then parsed out. And yeah, so the signature is verified, uh, it's decrypted, it's marshaled into the same message on the other side. So this is, uh, when someone comments on a message, it has an additional set of complications because the person who's commenting can't be responsible for distributing the comment. It has to go to the person who posted the original message because the set of people that uh, the commenter has access to isn't the set of people that the poster actually posted the post to. So, if someone posts a comment that the original poster doesn't like, he can delete it from this book. No. Well, the, this structure, federation structure, allows that in theory, but the UI doesn't break. So the way it works is the post is dispatched to a set of subscribers. Uh, comments are dispatched back to the owner of the post, and the owner of the post is responsible for sending them out again. Um, and it's, uh, it's the seven protocol, so it's, again, like another standard that is already out there. We're not reinventing the wheel here. So it's the same thing. The comment is well go back. You say like so it's the post is dispatch uh, we just outlined it. It's encrypted and signed and sent to subscribers which are the post recipients. Uh, so that happens. And um, then one guy decides to comment on it, he sends back another encrypted and signed comment, 
which the host owner receives. And then on the host owner's server, the server checks the signature, verifies it was somebody who could see the post. Uh, and then he signs it in addition to that other person and dispatches that comment to all the subscribers. So the subscriber list uh, exists just on the publisher's uh, The other subscribers aren't aware of the list, which is kind of nice. So you can't see all of your friends' comments to other posts oh, because you might not be. No, you can. That's the beauty of it. So uh, since everybody can see the post, right, from the post owner sends it out, once the post owner gets a comment back, he gives everybody who can see the post that comment. So you have a comment. But if, if I have a friend who's got some who's a friend with someone I don't know, so I don't receive the original comment. You know, the original well, post. you don't receive someone's comment on a post that you can't see. That's what, That's what he's asking, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so we also allow uh, subscriptions to someone's public posts through Adam feeds and through Pubs of Hubbub Pubs. And yeah, so anyone can subs subscribe by an RSS reader. And when you make a public post, it's posted to uh, Pubs of Hubbub Hub that you can find. For our pod, we use Google's AppSpot hub. And basically, you send a notification. That hub retrieves your Atom feed again and can distribute it to an arbitrary number of subscribers without putting that load on your uh, diaspora pod. So the Atom feed has you know, just a set of posts in the activity streams format with a feed title, and each post has whatever metadata feeds, title, message, time posted. And you can get to those at just slash public slash username.m. So that's our protocol right now. It's not final. It's another thing that we change probably weekly. And uh, we, don't, we don't change our protocol weekly. <laughs> 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 we're, we're, we're done with doing that. But uh, we do want to refine it, so like um, we're passi passing messages right now just with uh, just some basic <coughs> XML wrapper that we need to find. It's kind of arbitrary. But um, the idea is we wanted something that works, like everything federates right now, which is we were kind of going with dispatching information. We were going basically product over protocol. Like we didn't want to sit down and on mailing lists and talk about the protocol for like you know, two years. We we did it, we got something up and running, all information federates, now we can make it pretty. Now we want to make it so every message that's passed is in an activity streams format. Now activity streams is, uh, it's, it's being used more and more. I know Microsoft is starting to use it. Facebook, I think, has an activity streams API. So does Twitter. Um, so it's, it's um, you know, getting to speak the same language through um, an API, which we're also working on building, we're going to work on building. Um, so we're going to have restful routes for all resources so you can post status messages. And stuff. We also want to implement uh, OAuth and all that good stuff. But, um, but, uh, yeah, something else we'd like to do is uh, one of our goals with Diaspora is to take the social network space, which you know, right now consists of uh, totally separate networks, mostly on single websites, and we think that what we can bring to the table with Federation is competition between providers, not just on products, but also on privacy policy, on behavior, in a way that doesn't require giving up all that you've accumulated to yourself on a social networking website in order to change providers. <coughs> so one of the things we'd like to provide to sort of make that easy is the ability to migrate between providers without giving them out of hassle. And so it's a, so we want to program in, in a, an eject button so you can just like take your account and say like, I don't like the server anymore, I'm going to throw it somewhere else. And all that information goes with you. So you can download like a tarball? Yeah. Well, can, can you, you can also, now, but it's like kind of, you can't import it. But can you also have one server talk directly to another server 
and you don't even have to download it. That's the idea. Another thing we can talk about, but uh, the agenda. Yeah, we like to get to that. So the idea is you can completely take your stuff, delete all traces of you on that server, and put your stuff somewhere else. Can you make your stuff autonomous and viral, so it then just like kind of like goes off on the internet and explores various servers where it can uh, That'd be really cool. hang out? <laughs> <laughs> can you keep your name? Uh, that is something that we have to work on. Um, we don't know at this point, but that would definitely be awesome. That's like, if I own my own name, can I stick it on a different server? Um, well, I think one thing we probably will be able to set up is uh, a web finger profile that's basically a redirect to someone else's server. So, yes, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, you know, consistent UX improvement. We want to make it great for everybody, uh, even the most non-technical people. I want my sister to use it because it's going to be good for her. We want, we want a lot of non-technical people using free software. So that's our, our main goal. So speaking of non-technical users, how many users have Uh, it's kind of hard to say because it's distributed. Okay. Um, well, on our server, we have 40,000 users. And I'm going deaf. I thought you said 40,000 users. Yes. <laughs> that's unbelievable. Well, that's just ours. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Sorry that number is so low, Jay. Yes. No, it's, no, that's no, just it's, theirs. It's Cyber squatting, Jay. Um, yeah. No, but yes, they, 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 use, they, they like like I know somebody huh? who had never used a computer, and so um, she came to an install fest. And she has a fine Debian computer, uh, wonderful idea. And she discovered Facebook last year. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, she's very lucky. She didn't have a job. <laughs> it certainly made it impossible for her to get one. Uh, no, but, but she's, she's on Facebook like, I, I mean, it's incredible to see this thing. Yeah. Okay, so do they use it? They only have like an hour a day. Or well, we're working, we're working constantly on the, on the UX and we can get some great tests. We're going to talk about something okay. that's like totally awesome. But you might not know it. You might not know it on principle. No, we do. Okay. We know a lot of things. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's how it makes stuff better. So. And you know everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what you don't know? But how do you join this? Do <coughs> you get an invite from someone who's already there, or can you join We can go to join yeah, that. So account? right now, I mean, people, we're trying to keep the number of accounts we have down because you know, it lets us make UI changes. Uh, without hesitating. And when Make was invented, we still have the original man page for it. And it said, it's very unfortunate that the keyword is invisible to the naked eye and distinguished from the white steps and the tan. But they said, we couldn't possibly change it. We realized that for them, but obviously that was wrong. We couldn't change it, we had five years. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, we're, we're kind of running a little short on time, so let's, take, let's try to minimize the yeah. extra comments and stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So there are servers with open signups. Ours, we have a, a sign-up list where you can sign up to get an invite eventually, and that list has accumulated about 300,000 email addresses. To do. Yeah, we, we have to like go pretty quickly. Uh, we do want to get to how we run our fund because it's really awesome. But is it like really the question? How are we on time? We have until eight. Yeah, yeah, thirty minutes. Thirty minutes. Okay, we're Okay, so right now we run uh, Nginx as our web server. We run several thin app servers. That's a, a Ruby back web app server. Uh, 
uh, MySQL, a set of workers, because we have a lot of background processing, uh, all the federation stuff doesn't happen in the app servers. And Redis for mostly, we use it mostly for interprocess communication right now <coughs> on the WebSocket server for sort of snappier AJAX like experience. Uh, we use daemon tools to keep track of all of our processes. Um, it's pretty great. It's really simple. It runs scripts in the foreground, so it uh, lets you scripts <coughs> really easily without having to look up hits and stuff. And restart by setting interrupt signal. I saw the last screen backspace. Oh, yeah. So we run, we run use cloud files. We don't use cloud files. We actually use S3, Amazon's, Amazon's cloud file service, but we use one Rackspace server instance for our. No, we, we actually do use cloud files because we back up our MySQL database on the R. That's right. So, yeah, we do use that. Excuse me? That's incremental? Every R. Incremental, uh, you mean do we back up a whole database or a diff? Right. We do the whole database because it's way easier. <laughs> yeah, it gets pretty big per hour. Uh, does each instance have to hold copies of everything? Uh, no, they don't. But they do right now. Because <laughs> it took about five minutes to write that backup job. So. <laughs> All right, so one of the things we've been trying to do is because we foresee, a, we foresee a lot of deployments that aren't us is we try to maintain a set of deployment scripts which let anyone go from a clean server to a, a running diaspora instance in 15, 20 minutes without a lot of interaction. And so we have a set of Chef scripts. Chef is a Ruby tool for uh, automated provisioning that uh, we actually deploy <coughs> with a tool called Sod, which is another Ruby tool which... Made by your brother. Made by my brother. Wow. It's easy to get patches. <laughs> so that lets us go from a clean VM to really everything running without interaction, which I think it's uh, I think it's about to be great. Three to four clicks. You go to Rackspace or whoever, you request a box, you can get your domain name. <coughs> Those are the two hard steps. And then you get SOD, which is a little script. You give it your password and then you come back in 15 minutes and your site has a logon screen to ask and you're ready to federate with any other instance. It's like pretty freaking awesome. So that's basically a set of recipes for each piece for Nginx, for MySQL, for you know, every instance, every process that has to run. And uh, so, uh, yeah, this set of provisioning scripts also lets us keep server configuration in source control, which is really great because it's that sort of optimization, server configuration optimization, tends to be really easy to forget. So, and since we don't have any dedicated system administrators, basically all of our ops is DevOps, uh, let's keep under control. All right, so. One of our best tools is Access, <coughs> and we use Splunk for that, which is a really great log analysis tool. We use our logs for basically every piece of optimization that we do. Um, we're basically all about optimizing based on data, and we instrument every template from you know an individual comment template to whole pages, and every you know, request and every SQL query. And uh, we also keep cohort statistics, uh, which we're expanding the utility of daily. Basically, we can look at the set of users that joined in one week and see how we've succeeded in retaining those users. And uh, we're also able to keep statistics on you know, various VM stat types of statistics. Uh, in order to do this, we had to go through Rails and look at its default logging setup and change each piece of Rails logging system to log in a way that's friendly to Splunk, but it was definitely worth it because now we have great charts of you know how much how many milliseconds we spend in every SQL query on average, you know, how much is DBA, how 
much do we spend in total? And in templates, that's been great for particularly taking things like you know, queries and views, limiting those is a lot easier because we can see that you know, the standard deviation is really high, so there has to be a query there that occasionally is a catch. Um, one great thing that Splunk has by default is machine stats. It's actually as great as one of the but you know, we can keep track of the amount of free memory we have in the machine over time. We can see you know, how much memory each command is using. So if we have a memory spike, we can easily see what did it. And our CPU usage, you can see when we're actually at station for the server and doing things. And all right, so. So we have 10 more minutes? Well, what? no. Right, well, why don't we break for you, questions? That was only five minutes since. Never mind. No, you, you still have some time. All right, we'll break for questions, and if we have time or if we find it interesting, we'll talk about our migration from Mongo to MySQL. I'll let yeah. you guys know when you're running low on time. Thanks. I'm sorry to ask some questions, but I only came here to ask this one question. <laughs> I'd like to set encrypted email to a friend. I'd like for them to be able to send encrypted email. Can you speak up, please? I'd like to send encrypted email to a friend of mine. And I'd like my friend to send encrypted email to me. Now today, this is practically impossible, except that you've hired a professional sysadmin, or I think the so-called Blackberry does this to some extent, and they won't actually give you a system that really, there's no even story connected with it that makes you believe it actually works unless you're based in a corporation. But I'd like to do this. So it seems to me I'm correct over to this. You have almost solved this. Uh, yes, there You've is. You've almost solved it. I mean, I want to be able to make two or three phone calls. At the end of the time, we're, I can see something on my screen, after which, when I send an email to the person, using, I'll use their public key, it will, <laughs> It be encrypted to them when they receive it. They won't have to fool around with anything. They won't, you know, they, they might not even know emails. <laughs> I, 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 this is, and if you've done this, you're going to make a billion dollars. We have done this. Well, we have done this. <laughs> okay, but more importantly, we, this will help us perhaps overthrow the present plutocratic government of Earth. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure that's on the agenda for this evening. That's, we that's are we keep on, yeah, it's out of the necessary tool. That'll be the next one's talk. So, I got you guys an extra 15 minutes, but I ask that we keep questions to a minimum so we can get through different things. Okay, well, the answer, the answer is yes. Nobody, well, like, to a certain extent. We, we're not providing tools to let people make, you know, have communications where they don't trust anybody, they, everything on their computer, that's not what we're trying to do. Uh, all of our, our own system right now is, you know, you have to trust the server that you have your account on. So in the sense that you could run, in the sense that you, if you were running the email server for your friends, then that's the kind of level we're at. I mean, there are people who are trying to build email tools in particular. Fire GPG is one tool that has Gmail integration so that you can only send encrypted mail over Gmail and actually encrypts the text in your browser. Sure. But, uh, okay. and uh, there are a lot of people trying to build those things for mail clients. But the uh, central problem of, you know, can you take someone who isn't a technical person and try to get them to understand under what conditions you know that someone's public key is actually representing, you know. Right. Under what conditions you know someone's public key is actually that person's public key? That's you know, the difficult part. Well, it's also difficult for technical people. I've often asked the question, like, name the central function of the web of trust. Like, given these inputs, what should you write to the output? And of course, there is none. Yeah, I'm sorry. That was my question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How would we contribute? Awesome uh, question. Well, my answer to that would be, what are your skills? Because <laughs> there are a lot of places where. These contributions. Um, so we keep. Uh, so we have a wiki page on how to get installing running. 
and we keep a, <coughs> a bug tracker and a GitHub, and we have a really active IRC room because we have a lot of international contributors basically active 24-7. So I think uh, from at any moment, if you want to come and ask us what, what contributions would be most useful uh, in the IRC room or in the bug tracker, you can find that. Or it's anything really, like you know, JavaScript like, is my SQL, Ruby, Rails. You can totally find whatever basically interests you. Probably something that needs to be done. It's a very constantly evolving. What could be your financial model? What are you? How are you going to fund yourself for the long range in the future? Well, just be contributors or what? Our financial model is we think that uh, we can leverage user empowerment a great deal. Once people have power in their own hands, uh, uh, we could probably come up with some uh, data exchange we can securely commercial data. I mean, it's still like, we just got $200,000 to build this thing. We're building free software. We hate ads. Like, we're not going to do that. that really, at least in terms of that, in terms of about funding and individual pods or individual or are you talking about the development of, of the service itself? Uh, well, I think we're only going to worry about ourselves. I'm just running, running the app for the service itself. There is someone, I think a bunch of the other pods have ladder set up on their systems, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, the guy in Seattle is running it, David Morley, has like an insanely beefy box, and he just he just runs it like nobody asked him to. Like that's his jam. So he started yeah. running it, and like yeah, it's been great. Uh, is Google's uh, open social API or its patents had any impact on your work? Well, open social is an API for having uh, basically widgets uh, on your site. So we haven't gotten to having that kind of application framework. Uh, I think when we do, we'll look it up in social. I uh, This is the last slide. Uh, well, we do have. Yeah, we have a section on our, our migration from Mongo to MySQL, but it's uh, sort of optional. So but it'll, it'll be, I'll uh, put this on slideshow. But uh, I know we have a question. <laughs> uh, so what I'm gathering is you guys are pretty providing stitch work for many different sub-social servers. Yeah. So how do, you, how do you work about if, say, something happens to one? Is there a, a caching mechanism? Is there a queuing mechanism for messages? Or do you just tell the user that, that person, that server is offline? And it's gone? Uh, right now, messages are cached on the server. So if somebody's server, like, say, somebody decides to run it on their laptop, and they close the lid, like, that just means in its current state, like when I send a message out, you know, it'll just ping like dead space, right? Because the server isn't on. But, uh, yeah, so messages are cached right now. We're definitely uh, working on and thinking about improving the robustness of the system with servers are coming off offline and going online. I know you guys mentioned uh, product over protocol earlier, but are there any plans in the near future to start some sort of consortium to standardize these protocols so that you know, other languages can kind of jump on and you, know, you have this. Yeah. yeah, I think we've definitely reached a point where stabilizing and formalizing the protocol is necessary. And so we you know, are now looking at like, existing federated stuff and thinking about how best to do that. Well, the, the beauty of it is we are using a bunch of existing protocols. So right. Hubs of Hubba that exists, it's out there. Mm -hmm. If you look at Google's AppSpot server, it's like crazy. And like right. Superfeeder, those guys make this design. Yeah. So you have stuff like that. We also use Salmon Protocol, which is very well documented with respect for it. And we're using, uh, we're going to move to activity streams, except for, for pricing up. But um, yeah, we are using a lot of existing protocols, like Bush cards. Yeah. And I think in addition to that, I think it'd be great to have some sort of body to say, hey, you know, these are the diaspora Know, protocols and then have some sort of marketing effort behind that so that people are aware of like you know the protocols that are used 
the benefits, why they're being used, and then, you know, so it's... Yeah, it's, it's, absolutely. It's like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was just wondering, um, so if you, whatever uh, server you create the account, and that's where your messages live, essentially, right? So if I made, if I have a, if I have a pod, I create my own account, I create a blog post, that's like, if someone comments on that, like, isn't, can't I, by running this node, like, create comments by other people, essentially? As in, like, make smooth messages? Yeah. Well, you could create comments by, by non-existent people, you can create okay. accounts and then comments, okay. but, but you can't create comments by real other people. But why not? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, they're, they're real other people sign the comments they send out. Oh. If you're, but if you're running your own server, couldn't you just simply, you don't have the private key, it's kind of malicious, couldn't you just make it look like it came from those other people? Um, you could. Certainly, if you if you run a server, you can modify the code to show different things to your users. Uh, that's protecting users from their hosts uh, isn't what we're trying to do right now. You couldn't broadcast to somebody else's server and pretend to be the other person. That would most likely fail. Yeah, because an incoming comment, the signature is always verified. We okay. Have so well known routes that last part, the the verification, that was the curious yeah. part. Okay. Here, here's a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And right now it's all it's all manual. I think some people have written update scripts, but I think uh, well all all you have to do right now is you just do git pull origin master. Uh, it varies. The code is like <coughs> it flux a lot. Like we'll change the interface and stuff. But maybe like, I don't know, you can do it like a couple times a day or you can do it once a week. It really depends on the, the pod owner. But if there's anything crucial, like a change in a, our federation protocol, we contact those people because they want to be in touch with us. They're always in the IRC room. So we're in touch with them a lot. If you make any major change, like we'll make a note in the GitHub commit you know, or git commit. So it's been running pretty smoothly. Whatever people want. You have a uh, stable stage, which is we, there is no stable <laughs> tag. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's head. At all. Is, it, is there any branching at all? There's there's a well, we can work on feature branches, uh, but those feature branches are short -lived. Uh, yeah, they tend to be short lived, and they're they're always less stable than the master branch. But we also do, we do uh, continuous integration. We have a box set up that every time you push to GitHub, uh, it runs the whole test suite. So somebody can easily just look at uh, the, the ref on ci.join.asper.com. If you go there, you can see, maybe we can just go to this, but you can see which refs are green or so. It looks like we lost our Oh, um, yeah, Sarah May actually set up our two Oh, yeah. So, so, right so you don't want to pull that branch. But you want to pull <laughs> don't pull the latest graph, pull the one before. And Sarah May set this up. It's been enormously helpful to me <coughs> to have that system. This is less dumb commit. But uh, yeah, so you can see the build log, you can see what happens. It runs all the tests. Um, can you see it during the build or only after it's done? It, it auto refreshes when it's building, I think, like every couple of seconds. But I mean, you can run them on your own machine. They take but, about like six minutes. Yeah, it depends if you also run the browser integration. Yeah, we have specs that actually pop up in a browser and check and clicks around and sees if everything works. Do you have any expiry time attached to any message? Uh, how much time you will store those messages? Oh, like a cache? Yeah. Expire time? Yeah. Uh, not right now. That's something you definitely have to. Uh, but uh, no, not right now. Do you have any facility to import or export contacts from different sort of internet sites or email? Um, it's also we do. Uh, we have a Facebook friend finder. If that's what you're kind of like, you can you can connect your Facebook account.
account and it'll pull up your Facebook friend list. It'll say, these guys are on Diaspora already you can connect with them. And we actually figured out this pretty funny way of sending messages to Facebook people because the Facebook API doesn't allow you to directly send a message. But we figured out um, the URI to send a message just pre-populate the get parameters right. on Facebook. So if you're already logged in, you press send invite, and it generates an invite code on our site, and it pastes that invitation URL into the get parameter of Facebook. So you just do clicks and you can invite like, someone. If you're friends with them. You have to be friends with them, yeah. It just pulls up your friend list. With the new, uh, with the new Titan that they started rolling on Friday, you can send messages to anyone, even if you're not friends with them. Really? Absolutely. All you need is an open uh, mail relay server and to know the public address of any Facebook user. Oh, yeah. That's what it comes from. So it's, you're spoofing, spoofing the, uh, the sender address, which it's kind of a gaping security hole. Thanks for the tip. <laughs> 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 yeah, let me just like, this on my friend list. Can you imagine those people moving off something like they need to I'm sorry to use this sort of federated distributed system in these different places to launch. Do you imagine just all of these different domain names that people are going to go to and log into? Or is there some other? What do you tell people? How do you join to ask for us? Well, pick one of these seeds. Or is there a vision that you have? I don't think we claim to uh, be able to predict a mass migration to our software. I think that. And being <laughs> being the Linux of social networking would be a pretty big success, I think. Uh, even though we would pay for something, it would be a broader a broader user base. But yeah, I don't think it would be part of the future. Anything you did like in Facebook is better than diaspora. Excuse me. Anything which you did like in Facebook is better. <coughs> anything less than diaspora. Uh, anything that. You didn't like in Facebook. Like feature. Yeah, just other things. The big thing that we're trying to do, which is uh, our sort of UI proposition, is to make the UI more contextual, to make it so that you have you know more immediate and easy awareness of what set of people you're sending a post to or receiving a post from. So that's the. Uh, Always, always a better day. Sign up for an There you go. Is that always the length of your password, or is it one length regardless of the actual length of your password? Uh, the, the password box? You mean? The, yeah, the, the number of dots in the password <laughs> box. Is it always the same regardless of the actual length of your password? Yeah, I think that's a browser. So these images are all coming from S3. They're coming in with the whole This is from kind of what the uh, screenshot we saw earlier. So what we're trying to do is make it make it easy to switch between sets of people. You can see on the top. We have what we call aspects right now that represent your social circles. And what we're trying to do is make it so you can easily switch between and combine those sets of people to you know, look at those posts and send messages to those people in the blood. And do intersections? Uh, it doesn't do intersections right now. No, it does unions. I think. Uh, so I can select two groups.
something like that, but you know, things like aspect names are private. We had a post from a gentleman from Spain on the mailing list today. He wanted us to ask you about if there's any way to gather statistics from the other nodes, I guess aggregate statistics, to find out the number of users and stuff like that. Uh, not right now. Uh, we have thought about doing that, and I think we did get a patch at one point that didn't work out, that exposed some kind of statistics to the outside. Uh, one, one thing we definitely want to make available is the ability to tell some level of granularity, probably not individual reps, what version of the code someone is running and wherever we provide that server-wide info, we might do similar things if the person running the pod decides to expose that. Are there, uh, is there support for photos, like Facebook photos and sharing albums and such? Uh, yeah, you can post photos. And are those stored on, on the pod that, that you are on, I guess? Yeah. yeah. What about other media? Uh, right now it's only photos. So you can, but well, I noticed you have like YouTube or uh, links in there. But it won't, but when you click on it, will that post a different wall or a different Well, it'll, it'll expand browser. it in, in JavaScript and show it to you. But yeah. you also, you know, so no, of a, of a video. No. Your pod. Your pod. 
Oh, not my ISP, but watch my sign up to this guy and see if I got you in their account. Yeah. As opposed to an ISP, which I have. Okay. There's no way I can localize that, is there? I can say I want to hold stuff on my own computer. You can run the you can run the installation on your own server. That's the solution right now. But uh, maybe we'll yeah, Rob, it sounded to me like you were saying something slightly different uh, than what Daniel was saying at the beginning of the talk. It sounded to me that you were saying that your migration from Mongo to SQL was prompted by the, um, the tools that are available for administering and integrating SQL into your environment. Whereas at the top of the talk, Daniel actually said that what, what, what you're doing is very relationally or something, I believe was the word the phrase he used. Um, so is, was the migration prompted by, uh, by, by your, 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 work, your working schema? Or was it was it the tools? Was it a combination? Can you speak to that? I mean, I'm, I find it really fascinating to go to go that route from Mongo to SQL. I guess it was. I mean, it was both things. I think uh, I said the tools because you just said uh, why can switch to a graph database and that was sort of. We had oh, I see. Oh, I see. That was the answer to why not. Yeah. Got it. Okay, but um, but I'm really curious to what really prompted the move to SQL and what kind of thoughts you went into it. What 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 you had to weigh and give up and. Uh, uh, well, we had to give up basically when we were doing Mongo. Like, uh, we had to give up application side joins, which is a nightmare, and it yeah. was totally slow. Um, so that's what we gave up there. Well, there are some sort of a, the best ways to optimize a, a MySQL-based application are really well known and really explored, and uh, you know. Survey and Pivotal Labs a lot of experience with that, so that was sort of a, another reason. Well, and also, like, uh, Mongo is excellent at sharding large data sets, right? How our federation works is that each person, you know, each installation mm -hmm. has their own database. Right. We would never shard, pretty common to say we would never shard, so that's like right. a huge attraction to my, uh, Mongo. We wouldn't even be using that, right? So it seems like MySQL. Like and, how, and how much is, how, how actively does your schema uh, evolve and change? Because you were talking about your protocols changing, you know, on, on a week by week basis. That was another reason that Mongo was convenient at the beginning, is that we were you know, doing those schema changes all the time. Now it's not, probably not daily um, that we change the schema. But still, reasonably often, because it is under active development, we do. It's hard to add a feature without changing the schema in a lot of right. cases. Do so Rails migrations? Yes. We do use Rails migrations. It's obviously, if we didn't have, since we have multiple people running installations, it would be hard to not use a migration system like Rails, which lets people over time. Yeah, know the state of their database. I want to take a look at uh, VoltDB, possibly Drizzle. To, uh, their uh, SQL-based uh, solutions that uh, they probably put on the board. But anyway, um, is, you uh, have uh, any support for Gravatar or XO? Uh, we don't right now. Okay. It might be something that people could uh, contribute. Yeah. Oh, we thought that's the next, the next thing. We want these installations to be a lot for matters. Uh, and that's where we're going to build our API. Well, XOF is a little different than OAuth. XOF is uh, uh, how you, um, you have websites that might want to send you to different um, social uh, networks, like Facebook, Twitter, or Mebo is actually the one that came up with it. Um, and since you have no idea all the, the there, there's dozens and dozens of social media providers out there. So XAuth remembers their top list of, uh, of anybody that's like a client website, which social networks that they might like to connect to. You might want to take a look at XAuth. Uh, it'd be a good way yeah. of building um, publicity for what you're doing. I've, I've read about it. We haven't gotten to that sort of that, uh, Set of features, yeah, so. mm -hmm. I, I actually have three questions. The first one is, you may have covered it already, but uh, what, if any, help do you guys need, both from like coding or logistical or financial, and how, how and the best way for people to 
help with get started with helping you if if you guys need help. The second question is uh, Nylog is now running a pod, and um, if you guys have time afterwards, we want to know how to get started with Federation. You know, and the third one is. Uh, have you thought about scaling pods into like a tens of millions of users, or is that like I mean, so I could see you know like if a big provider ever got into it, you know they could have <coughs> at bigprovider.com a lot of people. And this have thought about how you would scale that. Yeah, so we haven't thought about scaling pods to the tens of millions of users because there are no pods that would have hundreds of thousands of users, but. Uh, I mean, to the extent that we have thought about it, it's, you know, to say it would be good to leverage the federation protocol that we have to help that. And I think uh, the question of how to scale a single website, a lot of those, a lot of those problems would be the same on a dashboard installation. So, I don't know, we're thinking around user buildings. Yeah, yeah, we're like, kicking around the idea of load balancing to mm -hmm. to actually separate diaspora installations behind uh, you know a web server that would have you know that would be a front end that one domain name for a whole set of different uh, working installations. Starting the username. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we, you have a cluster of different completely different installations, and you start a new. I mean, this is like totally. Since we already have a key that we can shard on, yeah. why not do it that way? But that's uh, that's in the future, no, not tomorrow. Since you're federated and have all these pods, could a user's actual experience regarding privacy, ease of use, other considerations? I mean, it seems the pods have pretty much, or the installations pretty much control all that by the way they run it. So one could have vastly different experiences of diaspora depending on what uh, what installation or pod one went to. Absolutely, and this, like, as long as we keep the, uh, the protocol, like spec'd up, like, that's actually something that we want, right? We want, I think Rebecca said before, just competition between between privacy policies, between experience, you know. We'd have some that were practically the equivalent of Facebook and others that protected your privacy zealously. And that's totally fine, because at the end of the day, like, I just, I, we were on, this is kind of, but like, we were on Virgin America flying here, and they were offering you free internet as long as you use Facebook. It's just like, really made me furious, but, I mean, you could have all these different experiences, but, uh, nice. as long as you, you can move around. Five in the morning. Five minutes, but, yeah, I mean, there has to be not just one, and you could have different experiences, you can have something like Facebook, that's totally fine if that's your thing, but uh, I don't want to live in a world where I have to use Facebook to get things. Boy, are you going to hate the future. <laughs> <laughs> the, the funniest part of it was that Facebook's functionality was pretty well because they would only let you make requests to your Facebook domain name. So all their third party apps were broken. Right. Question. Yeah. Um, how are you going to deal with hostile pods? Uh, we haven't confronted <coughs> that problem in uh, even on a depth. Yeah, uh, certainly that is hard, it's hard to do at a public level. That's uh, kind of a difficult problem to know, you know, how do you, how do you deal with sort of, you know, something like hostile stores today or credit card fraud today? Well, so, I mean, if you give me give a specific example of a kind of hostility. Um, you know, say I, I, I'm going to put up a harvesting pod who is going to um, collect all of the keys uh, from anyone that, that, that shares keys with any user on my pod. And they're going to use those keys to get key exchange because the key exchange is being done on the pod. Yes. What do you mean? Public keys? The, if, if I'm doing your, your, your decryption, where does the decryption happen? Decryption, right now, the decryption happens on the pod. So. On the web server. So if I have a, if I have a, a hostile pod, and I'm doing the decryption, uh, then I can um, start to, to uh, gather information. <coughs> it's only a you can gather. I, I can gather public keys. But the thing is that they're uh, How do I say? 
any information that comes into me doesn't have to stay with the user that the user is encrypted there by the key. Yeah, I mean, any website that can get people to sign up for it has access to information about that person, right? It has like a has a username, e uh, I mean, a, an email password pair that you know that's going to work on a lot of other websites that person uses. So the challenge of like how do we deal with malicious websites is a, a larger challenge that the internet is trying to confront. So I, I think the point is that you're. You have to be able to trust your own seed or pod. And if you don't, then find a different one. And any pod or seed can do anything on behalf of any of its users, but only on behalf of its own users, not on behalf of users from other pods. Right. And the idea is that um, it can scale down to one user. So yeah. at the end of the day, we want. We have our pod, but we and want everybody. To, we want, yeah, we want people to export their accounts and eventually move it to under their bed because it's one system. Wouldn't wouldn't each message look at a message What you mean at the database level? And would you look at that message on on the pod? You're not going to see you know test comments. You're going to see you know. You mean on disk? Yeah, I'm going to be able to read it as a test comment. It's in the database in plain text right now. That's oh. sort of not a okay. not relevant to the, the security of the federation system, whether it's encrypted right. on disk. Do you also it. store the encrypted version? No. Or? We don't right now. I mean, there are reasons that could be, could be useful to do that in the future. I think we're out of time. Yeah, oh, we're going to start wrapping up. Um, one last question, though. Can you, all the information you shared tonight, can you put it listed to the Nylog mailing list? Uh, information yeah. about like, the resources, sites? We'll post this uh, entire uh, slideshow because there is, I mean, there is that whole section on they're gonna post the database the migration, which is right. really interesting. Where are they going to post it? it it's a mailing list. We'll send it to one of you guys. All right. One more question. Okay. I just have a question about the privacy. Um, could you, on your public um, site, could you have a, a user-friendly comparison of different pods? So if somebody wants to sign up with a pod, they can add a quick sort of look. They can have a good indication of privacy policies. So that, uh, yeah, that's directory. something you know, we'd like to do that, to have a directory of pods. I saw a list of no idea. No way of telling where they were all located unless they chose to say so. And no way of telling which one was worth it either. Yeah, right now there's someone who's made a, a list. Uh, Sargadari made a, a pot up, I think he calls it, which shows their uptime and their reliability. But not anything else right now. So does he have to make count? No, he just pings the number to do a way to get uptime. Hey, this was a great talk. So one last question for Daniel Raffi. Will you join us afterwards for some beer and food at a, a local bar? Which one? Um, yeah. we, we have reservations uh, for as many people as wish to go there at the House of Brews, which is on West 51st at 8th Avenue. Uh, yeah, we're, we're ditching Fridays.